Hello, everyone. Welcome to All Things College and Career, the podcast to turn to for all of your college and career planning needs. We are your hosts, Meg Gary and Bobby Ryan, owners of Academic and Career Advising Services located in Kennebunk, Maine. We started this podcast to provide helpful information to listeners researching careers, colleges, or academic majors. Choosing your career or a college is such a big decision, which is why our motto is learn before you leap. Before investing a lot of time or money, it's so important to do your research and to really explore your options. Each podcast will offer interesting stories and valuable insights that we think you will find entertaining and informative. Subscribe to our podcast and you'll have it ready to go on your playlist every Monday morning. So learn before you leap each week with us. On today's podcast, we have Michael Guptel, owner and executive producer of Hatmatak Playhouse located in Berwick, Maine. We learned from Michael the story of Hatmatak Playhouse, named for the trees on their 200 acres, and all about running a theater and tips for those who want to open a local theater in their own area. Michael gets up at 2.30 to go to work in Boston, where he is a sales and marketing manager and a produce buyer for Gold Bell. He has a degree in agricultural economics and talks about how he went from college to his current position. This podcast covers Michael's two careers and shows how you do not necessarily have to choose between the two things you love to do. Sometimes with a little creativity, you can do both. Let's get to our conversation with Michael and find out how. Hello, Michael Gupto. Welcome to All Things College and Career. Thank you so much for doing the podcast it's today. Great, great to have you here. <laughs> Thanks, Michael Gupto. We really appreciate you having us here. Yeah. So we're all at the same table tonight, which is great. And we're live from Hatmatap Playhouse. In Berwick, Maine. <laughs> exactly. So, Michael, we're just going to get right into this podcast and ask you, well, first of all, I want to introduce that you are the executive producer and owner of Hatmatap Playhouse. Correct. Correct. Yep. So, <laughs> given that, we wanted to ask you, what are three things you love about your job? Well, I love this job. I guess uh, I'll give you three reasons, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Since you're asked for three. That's Sounds what good. we're looking uh, for. <laughs> I, I think, well, you both know that this is at my home. Mm-hmm. So, it's very special for me because I live here. It's a farm. It's been in our family for generations. But we all get to experience constant art, you know, putting on musical plays, putting on straight plays. So I guess that's number one and number two together because Mm -hmm. the second thing is just being able to produce something really out of nothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, it's a summer stock theater that we own, or I own, which means you have, you know, a collection of costumes, a collection of set pieces, you bring in a collection of people and you produce a show and we can produce whatever we want to. And it's an artistic expression, plus it's a fun time for everyone. And I guess the third reason would be we have a lot of family involved in different aspects of the theater. I think all of the hackmatackers, all of the actors, all of the technical people, and even the audience that comes here, they become part of the family. But also my personal family is all around me and involved in different ways. So I think that would be one, two, and three. Yeah, wow. that does make it special. That, that makes it so special. And you touched on the fact that the property has been in your family for a long time. Yes, and since 1600s. That's amazing. Yeah. And how many acres are we sitting on here? It's just under 200. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, and we've It's always been a working farm. Right. And it still is a working farm. Back in 1972, my dad sold the cows that we had mm-hmm. uh, in the barn and He cleaned the barn and put in seats and tin can stage lights and started the theater. (laughs) Since 1972. Right. Wow, that's amazing. And you say it's still a working farm. What are you? Well, we actually raise bison on the farm now. That's so cool. We've heard of bison. We do grow some other things too, blueberries and strawberries, but it's the bison that brings in income to the farm. Yeah, and that's been here for about five years now? or Uh, Maybe a little over. Over now. Well, see, when you get old, time just goes by fast. So in fact, fact the box office staff, part of their uh, responsibility is is selling uh, bison meat. Well, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. It's absolutely gorgeous. And you should all come by and catch a play here someday and check it out. It's beautiful. Thank you. 
So, Michael, we're going to just get into your academic life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have to all or, think back to when where, we were in college. Where this all began. <laughs> yeah, okay. where this all began. So, as a young strapping lad, you went off to the University of Maine at Orono. Correct, yeah. Yeah, and so what did you study there? Um, I went in as a political science major, mm-hmm. and I really didn't think after a year or so that was going to be worth a whole lot when I graduated. Right. It's tough to get a job as a poli-sci major. I I saw no jobs to be had. Right. Um, Not without going into law school. uh, uh, Perhaps law school or (laughs) or grad school. Grad school. I I Mm -hmm. guess even though I'm interested in political science, maybe I wasn't that interested in it. Right. And then I switched majors for maybe one semester to agricultural engineering. Mm-hmm. And then I realized I wasn't really an engineer. <laughs> I, as a fact, but it I, seemed like a fitting. Well, no, I was very, I, I guess I was interested in it. But um, I remember one time I had this pretty major test that I did. It was, you know, a mathematical engineering test. And all my answers were exactly half off. And they were all my math was done correctly. And, you know, I just couldn't figure out why in the world... And the professor couldn't figure out why in the world it was all half off until we realized early on in the process we were supposed to multiply the number of hours of a day. And, you know, I put in 12 hours right. in the day and then it was half off because it's, of it's 24 hours <laughs> in the day. Right. So I figured so. I'd better not be building any bridges. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So, so I switched my major to agricultural economics. Okay. There's a lot more fudge factor involved. Yeah. Yes, uh, I could be off by 50%. And you no could, worries. You would, <laughs> You didn't have to worry about it. Nobody was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting progression, though. And I mean, I think a lot of 18-year-olds head off to college and literally have no idea what they want to do. So that's part of the fun. Well, I think the agricultural, well, the economics, anyways, um, is a lot of, I, I mean, I had the background and interest in political science and mm-hmm. uh, economics kind of fit. Uh, they can go hand in hand. They went hand in hand. Yeah. And then I was had the agricultural background as I... Absolutely. Growing really, up on a farm. We grew up on a farm. We had cows on the farm back when I was younger. We grew a lot of vegetables. We picked strawberries. <laughs> you might you might know that story. Pick, don't peas. know a thing about it. <laughs> so we picked... Um, my I think favorite there's a job actually that goes with this. <laughs> One of my first and favorite jobs, picking strawberries at what a quarter a, a 25, 25 cents for a quart, a quart and yeah. peas were five cents a pound i believe that's right at any rate i used to sell a lot as the farm got bigger we used to sell a lot to different grocery store local grocery stores we had a farm stand out front as you know mm-hmm. so i was interested in agricultural things i knew i'd run the farm one day mm-hmm. and so i graduated in ag economic yeah that seems that so appropriate and fitting yeah yep and your dad was probably glad because he thought great uh, i'm gonna have someone come in and run the farm um i think he was pretty open for me to do whatever i wanted yeah, to that's he cool. was not that kind of guy that right was gonna, directing your no, life not at all that's good. But uh, he was interested in someone taking over the farm. Sure, yeah. As this farm's been in the family for since the 1600s. So. I, that's, that's, that's just, just amazing. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Has it always been a guptal? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a guptal that originally lived in this house back yeah. in the 1600s. Correct. That is great history. I wonder how many generations that was. Quite a few. I can show you some pictures in the other I room bet. before you leave. And I'm wondering <laughs> how rare that is, like how many families in the yeah. u.s can claim that probably very, it is very rare. few yeah and you know yeah. I'm, I'm sure you don't want to get into this in the podcast but <laughs> we might want you know to. the tuttle farm over in dover the yeah red, right. red barn. and he and one of the tuttle boys billy tuttle yeah about my age yeah and he was in the same position as me he had a bigger operation over there you know he's a, yeah. he had a big operation that's a big operation years ago yeah And then he sold the farm eventually. And one of the reasons he sold his farm is he did not want his kids to have to run the farm Mm. like he was forced to run the farm by his father. Right. Pretty interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. Do you foresee that as being a problem for one of your kids or... Um, I don't know. We'll get to see again. <laughs> to be determined. <laughs> TBD. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Anyways, after graduating from college, I did do a little bit of work for another farm in Yarmouth. I was the farm manager up there. But basically, my first kind of professional job off the farm was working as a railroad inspector from a guy who also graduated from the University of Maine probably back in 19, probably when my father did, right. wow. uh, 1952 or so. And he always liked to hire people from UMO. And I was a produce inspector actually for the railroads, the old BM, 
Yeah. Uh, BM, B&M, Boston and Maine Railroad, <laughs> yeah, Boston yeah. and Clonrail, and mm-hmm. it was a collection of railroads. So I became a produce inspector. Really, one job after another has led me to the other job that I do right now, which is my real job, mm-hmm. which is buyer and uh, salesman and marketer for a company in, in Boston called uh, Gold Bell. Gold, Gold Bell. Bell. So they do they mostly do fruits and vegetables? Yes. Or? Okay. Yeah. And you're the salesperson? I'm the sales manager. Sales manager. It sales and marketing manager, but there's a lot of buying that I do as well. Okay. You clearly had a strong background to come into that position, beginning on growing up on a farm, yeah. majoring in yeah. agricultural economics in college and working in the industry right from the get-go. So yeah. you bring a lot of experience to that role, I'm imagining. I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> So you have to explain to us what that job is like. What exactly do you do or roughly do you do? Well, my company, we own a farm, but much more we have contracts with farms around the country and we sell those individual farm products to stores in the Northeast. Do you deal with really large farms or smaller farms? Um, all, any farm. Yeah, any we, farm. We deal with some very small farms, very large farms. Okay, so um, all sizes. All sizes. And then we sell to Stop and Shop and Hannaford and Trader Joe's and Market Basket, grocery store chains and some other places as well. Uh, anybody who wants to buy the product will right. sell the product right. as long as they want to pay their bills. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anybody looking for some fruit and vegetables, <laughs> get in touch. Oh, yeah. Yes, well, right. we don't usually sell individual consumers. No, of course not. Yeah. No, I but meant a grocery store yeah. manager or <laughs> chain <laughs> right, store exactly. of some kind yeah. out yes, there. No, we, so we buy, well, I personally buy probably 20 or 30 truckloads a week wow. of, of different kinds of produce. Depends on location, the time of year, and what people are looking for, what people want to sell, what people want to buy. Do you buy it and store it in Boston and then distribute it? Or? Sometimes uh, we have four different warehouses across the eastern U.S. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we don't store it. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do a lot of repackaging into store private label brands. Oh, okay. Like if you go into Trader Joe's and you pick up uh, potatoes or onions or corn. It says Trader Joe's, but that came from Gold Bell. Right. So if, if someone wanted to be in this career, what would they, I mean, obviously you have a degree in agriculture uh-huh. science, right? Ag- economics. Economics. economics, right. Yeah. So that yeah. was like a good combination between business and agriculture. So you oh, think yeah. that would be kind of the recommended path if someone wanted to go into this career. It definitely would be a recommended Very path. A recommended path, but uh-huh. not the only one. No. Like what type of personality traits are good for this role? What do you think is important? There's some degree of analysis that goes into it. Right. But there's some degree of, uh, you know, just understanding markets and understanding uh, times of years and Mm -hmm. seasons and seasonalities. And uh, it's a lot of trying to understand what your customers want and what farmers have to sell. I'm interested in making money from my company as well. So sometimes you can make money on things that the farmer has, but he doesn't know they're worth something. You right. know, just get some knowledge and experience. Um, if some young person was starting out and they wanted to have the goal of doing what you are currently doing, what path would you recommend? Like what that's, would, what well, would be the steps? Well, that's definitely one path. We have other guys that work for us, work for me. Several of them came up through a grocery store chain. Okay. So they worked for a grocery store chain for quite a while, it's maybe uh, as a produce manager and then maybe a produce buyer and then gained experience with produce. So that'd in that be way. a good tip on how to work your way up is maybe start out in a grocery store and oh, yeah. in the produce section and work your way on up. Yeah. 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 Okay. And it's interesting, too, because you see, especially with retail grocery store chains, um, they like to hire from within. And when you get to the higher echelons of those grocery store chains, you find out that these guys worked as baggers, you know, in high school. They stocked the shelves in high school. Right. Almost every one of them have. It's That's amazing. And they yeah. just stay with the organization for many, many years. Yeah. And eventually, you know, the, the cream rises to the top and they get other jobs within the company. And then Is a degree required? or uh, For my particular job? For or someone that wants to reach, yeah, your level. I don't think it's required. But I it's definitely advised. think it's helpful. Yeah. Helpful, yeah. yeah. Doesn't okay. hurt. Usually doesn't. Extremely helpful. <laughs> <which is. laughs> yeah, so coming out of college, you were working in these various positions, but you were also had your hand involved in the theater as well. Is that Correct. right? Correct, yeah. So what was your role in Hat Matak as a young person fresh out of college? Well, as a 
college person. I mean, I did a lot of acting, right. singing right. back then. Little Abner comes to my mind. Yes, I yes. remember that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did other things too. Yeah, but what I were mean, some I, of I your think, favorite roles that you were in? Well, I, I'm not sure if I want to talk about, I, I, you know, I'm not really an actor, seriously. I, did, I thought you did all right. Yeah. I, I did some acting, but um, my father expected us to do acting. Right. But It was a family affair. It was, it was a family affair, but, we, but I like to sing. Yeah. Eventually, I did almost anything and everything here at one point mm-hmm. or another. You know, ran lights, ran electrical equipment, put in electric lines, stage managed, directed, ran the box office, ran, you know, advertising or sold advertising. Not one aspect. Did you do any work with the costumes or set design or? Set design, yeah. Costumes, I really have not <laughs> spent much time on. <laughs> but I guess that's one thing I've really yeah. not done is costumes. But other than that, you pretty, pretty much. much touched on everything and that's probably a good thing to be in a position where you're producing and owning now that you really learned it from the ground up yeah definitely at least i know what it's about all right well let's just get right into what is it like to run a theater um this is a summer theater right so it's a year-round operation even though it's just runs in the summertime sure so usually in the fall september october i'm doing a lot of reading of shows trying to decide what show is right for us what shows right for the customers that we have and then deciding on uh, you know do we have the technical capacity to do it what kind of people do we need to put on this kind of show and i'll work with the artistic director to decide on what shows will be performing uh, the next summer uh trying to have the season decided upon by you know thanksgiving time and then Basically, so for, speaking of that, not to yeah. cut you off, but what can we look forward to coming up this summer? Are you oh, this okay coming to, summer? Yeah, this, can this you announce? Just, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I have the schedule hanging on my wall right now. Oh, oh great. I, I, I <laughs> only because I ran into Mike in Hanford and I got a, a yeah, program. A program. Yeah. Uh, anyways, we are doing Always Patsy Klein. Oh. Which is a Patsy Klein tribute show. Yeah, awesome. And then Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime and Mamma Mia and Peter and the Star Catcher. Awesome. Oh, yeah. So it's just the four. They're just four shows. Okay. Is we, that unusual? We've done four shows the last two or three years. Okay. And that's, you know, a formula that we kind of fiddle with all the time, four, five, six shows. I don't know. I kind of like doing four shows because um, it gives a little more time for people to talk about the show. The best, mm-hmm. Our best publicity is word of mouth, right? Mm-hmm. frankly, because uh, we can't afford advertising. So, sure. or a lot of advertising. So, um, you know, good word of mouth mm-hmm. makes the show popular and it takes another week maybe to get people talking about it. Right. And then there's some savings to only do four shows over five or six. Set design and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Less costumes. And actors. Uh, not actors, because you have to be the actors, but directors. You'll only pay one director, one musical director, one... Stage manager. A, uh, <laughs> well, the stage manager will be... Year round. Well, the whole will summer. Be, yeah, but the director, you know, the artistic team that will just put together the show, they'll come and go and they'll be good for a three-week run instead of a two-week run. Right. Makes sense. Artistic and and do you have expensive. to pay less for the rights when you do four shows versus six? Or? Uh, uh, the rights are based on the number of performances. They are. So. Okay. So there's no great savings in that yeah. then. Yeah. No. Not that I'm looking for a number, but is that expensive to get the rights to a show? Depends on the show, but yes, it if, is. Yeah. If it's older, is it less well, e- Usually less expensive. Okay. Uh, like Mamma Mia is um, quite expensive. I bet. Brand yeah. New, show. That's new what and I popular. Although yeah. Patsy Klein's is very expensive show too yeah so it just depends that, uh, now uh, those are both musicals and, Correct. and the other two are peter and the stock catcher is kind of an odd show in that it's it's like a play with music yeah that's what they call it it's a story of peter pan right and it does have some music in it but it's not really a musical you'd have to see, come and see the show <laughs> you know, absolutely that. that's what well, you we want do. our listeners yeah. to come and see too yeah. Yeah. yes so yeah, then they'll they... understand it's an excellent show hilariously funny good for the whole family it's not really well known but yeah i've never heard of kids would love it i mean it's got a lot of pirates and orphans and good guys and bad guys and right silliness over the top silliness (laughs) yeah that's Uh, always fun dave barry remember you know dave barry yes the the writer of Mm -hmm. the humor writer Mm -hmm. for the miami herald yeah, I know that name, yeah, Dave yeah. Barry. He wrote, yeah. he wrote the show. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he's a comedian too, right? He's a comedian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it should be funny. No, it, is, it will be <laughs> very funny. So back up, Mike. You yeah. were talking about, before we get on to what's going to be on this summer, we were talking about during the off-season, you yeah. sit down and you pick out what so after, plays. 
Correct. After mm-hmm. we've picked out the shows we're going to be performing, it's a matter of, you know, we, kind of a two-track thing. You've got to start building promotion, publicity for the shows that you've decided. Mm-hmm. And then the artistic director kind of takes the ball and we pick out directors for the shows, musical directors, and then start the audition process for actors and putting the artistic teams together. And that's another process that goes on at the same time. And that's what we do from December till we open the, right. the theater on June 14th. And when, so when you open in June, do you basically know who's going to be filling all the parts I hope so. for the season? I hope yeah. somebody, somebody quit. Yeah, right. Yeah. And do you ever have any trouble filling those parts, or is there plenty of actors that come back year after year and directors and... We sometimes do. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a trick to make sure that we don't have problems. I mean, there are a number of reasons, you know, that someone may not want a role. Some people never want to be in or see, again, Sound of Music. Right. I'm not going to do Sound of Music again. But right. then some people would love to pay, play the role of Maria. Yes. And they love the show. And then there's, you know, audiences that don't want to ever come again. And there's audience people that... Would love to come again, sure. again and again and again. That's sure. That's so, going to be I mean, quite it, a juggling it, trying it, to. So right, that's part of the trick: juggling mm-hmm. those kind of shows mm-hmm. with shows like the Curious Incident that we're doing this coming summer. Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, very interesting show, extremely interesting. But people don't know it. Yeah. But actors have come out of the woodwork wanting to be in that show. For an actor, it's a wonderful, wonderful show. They can show off their talents incredibly. Maybe they don't want to be in Mamma Mia. But right. if we give them a package, they'll do them both. <laughs> right. like, so there's a little negotiating. There's a little negotiation in that kind That's of fair thing. enough. Yeah. That okay. seems like a good yeah. trade right there. <laughs> Oftentimes you put together those kind of shows. Or maybe if you have one show that requires a lot of dancers, maybe you'll put a second one on the same summer that requires a lot of dancers. Right. So you can yeah. use them twice, perhaps. I, I assume your actors are pretty much all ages, but correct. what is the majority, would you say? Do you have high school, college, or um, are then adult? I guess majority would be college if you had to pick a majority. But one thing that we do, that we like to do and we always have done, so we like to have age-appropriate actors. Right. So if, if the show calls for older actors, we have older actors. Mm-hmm. If the show calls for younger actors, we have younger actors. Right. And, and a lot of musicals have big dance numbers, mm-hmm. which they don't care if you're older or young, and usually you put young yeah. actors, college yeah. types. And, you know, there's always ingenues and, you know, oftentimes the leading men or college age or could be college age. Do they come from local colleges or, or are they kids that live in the area that go away to college and are home for the summer? Or? Um, it's a combination. It's a combination. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, frankly, as a theater producer, I don't like to be a landlord too, but we always are looking for rental units. You know, I think we have eight actors this summer that we have to find a home for. And I don't really like to do that, but, it, you know, sometimes it's necessary. If you're local or have a local place to stay, you know, your grandmother or your aunt or something, it's always a benefit. And especially right now, it's really hard to get a rental. Yeah, I know. I had a real hard time. We have a lot of homes, uh, friends of the theater that are willing and, and do mm-hmm. put up actors for us for the summer which could be like a five-week arrangement which is nice that is nice so if any listeners have a spot for an actor give michael a call yeah Yeah, absolutely and and if you're local and if you're local (laughs) local if you're in california that may not help (laughs) right and then you know 20 mile radius of yeah 20 mile radius probably yeah that would work well actually this year was and oftentimes what we do is sublet student housing at unh that makes sense Because I was trying to think in our area of gets busy here in the summer, but yeah. that's one place where it's quieter, yeah. UNH. Yeah. You were talking about managing a theater, what that entails, right? right? So well, go ahead. Most of the artistic responsibilities become the responsibility of the artistic director. I mean, I certainly have a hand in, in what she does, what he mm-hmm. or she does. Uh, Crystal Lisbon right now. I kind of watch over her. I, I watch the budget a lot. I mean, you know, we, we only have so much money to spend and our whole artistic team is very expensive. Definitely the biggest part of our budget. But most of the artistic th- duties she kind of handles the artistic mm-hmm. director where I try to handle most of the management and production and advertising and um, promotional responsibilities. Right. Box Sounds office. Sounds like a good division of labor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Does she manage the actors and hiring them and deciding the roles generally? generally yeah. But you I mean, have a hand. I in have it. a hand. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, she and I and the directors of each show. You know, we we get together, it's compare a notes. It's a little bit of a collaboration. Yeah. I do more, I guess, vetoing than anything else. I mm-hmm. mean, I, perhaps I know somebody. Maybe somebody's a problem actor. <laughs> right. We've had before. Some we've history. heard stories of of a right. problem. 
and yeah. I'll say, you know, this this person isn't right for us. Yeah, you know, yeah. they might want to um, rethink. But it just depends. Her responsibility to kind of oversee the autistic side. There's a lot to manage there. Yeah. Would you have any tips for another listener, possibly interested in opening up a theater in their hometown? Oh, I'd give us the good advice. <laughs> but, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> run and run for your life. No. Well, I, I think. What if they're you, passionate but, about it, though? What if it's their dream? As you both know, I mean, this was kind of my father's dream. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was always interested in theater, and he had the opportunity to make a theater right in his backyard. But there's it's a lot of expenses that go into it, and it, it's not as lucrative. It's not all that lucrative. Sure, right. Because if you have a dream and you want to go for it, go for it, I right, guess. But, right. but I don't, be, be, be realistic. You might you know, need a side hustle. <laughs> definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would say... Start with a very small space. You know, we have 213 seats. It's a lot of seats to fill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we pay royalties on 213 seats. And you, but you have to be very creative, too. You, if you have a dream, you really need to be creative. Because, right. I mean, I think there's ways to do it, but being creative is very important. Right. right. And when you say that, you mean creative ways to raise money, creative ways to get staff, the, actors. I, exactly. Creative things to do with your theater space or what you want to do with theater. If you want to be maybe just kind of a mainstream theater, it's hard to be creative. You know? Maybe yeah. try to distinguish yourself somehow. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you've got sort of a unique approach here because it's in a barn and it's on a farm it's you know got a it's special it's got a special a feeling about it but that's a really good tip to start small and maybe perhaps when you think about that allow for growth if you can add on if mm-hmm. you're meeting demand but mm-hmm. right and find other opportunities to do with your space mm-hmm. i think if you have something special about the property other other than the fact that it's just a the theater is enticing to people i think a lot of people come here because hat attack is special correct yeah you're they correct. enjoy strolling the grounds the, and, you're correct yeah you're mm-hmm. correct i mean and, and sometimes we can get away with maybe not having the show as good as we would would like it to be or right. others would think it should be or something uh, we don't we're not very i don't think here. you should say that the well, shows are fantastic well, thank you. I they really that. are. Yeah. They're they're amazing. Yeah, yeah. You well, do a f- an amazing job in we, the sound, and we can get away with things that other people can't. One of our former artistic directors, Sharon Hilton, right? You know Sharon. Yeah, we, she would always say, "We don't do magic very well." <laughs> in, in that it's hard for us to transform the mouse and pumpkin into a horse and carriage. Right. right. Very yeah. hard. Right. On our stage, especially during matinees, when you know all the outside light comes in and you know everybody can right. see right. what yeah. we're doing, <laughs> right. exactly. you don't have the opportunity to flip off the light. But yeah, and but I think that's that, part of the experience. Well, it is part of the experience. Yeah, we yeah. just and that's part of the, the reason why we have to be careful on some of the shows we do. Uh, Select carefully. So, yeah, I mean, we if you do um, shows that are based on movies, people mm-hmm. expect the movie on the stage but yeah yeah of course. sometimes it's extremely hard for us to do yeah right. you know, absolutely. That we don't have the money to do that but mm-hmm. on the other hand i know like i've seen things on your schedule in the past that i think how the heck are they going to do that done some and you guys amazing. pull yeah. it off which is we've done some amazing things yeah a little intermission here we decided to leave this next part in because we thought it was funny it only take a second you know i know that's coming are you trying to call me on the other line too? I'll call you in a little bit though. I know I, I'm in, in I'm in an interview right now. I'm on yeah, all things on college air. and career. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm doing a podcast. You all want me to listen to podcasts all the time. I am in a podcast like this moment. Okay. We hope that gave you a little laugh. Okay, back to the podcast. We were talking about the charm of Hat Attack and just wondering if you could expound upon some of your unique characteristics a bit. Like, I know everybody always looks forward to the blueberry pie, for example. <laughs> yeah, your wife's awesome. Cake. And blueberry strawberry pie shortcake. And, yeah. and these are we like to do things that little, come from the garden. Yeah, here. we love to do those little things to yes. make people feel more welcome. Right. I mean, we just kind of do those naturally, really. I right. Think. You don't realize yeah. they're special, no, but we no. all, people that come here, we look yeah, forward people, to those things. People yeah. don't like us to change. And, and I always tell people, don't worry much. We haven't any money to change. <laughs> 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 Not know, a problem. Exactly. <laughs> One thing that I think is special, Michael, is that you are here to greet everyone and you usually open the shows, or at least my experience. I like to. Yeah. yeah. I mm-hmm. usually like to tell a little joke. Yeah. Too. Yeah. We <laughs> have a little joke. But those things are special and unique right. and so give it the family flavor. I like to do, yeah. I, community I like. flavor. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I like to be kind of down home and be comfortable. And you know what? I think 
part of the reason I do that is just because I think that's my style. Mm-hmm. Um, part of the reason I do that is because I really like theater and love love theater. None of the, the shows that we produce are ever very edgy or avant-garde. We want everyone to be comfortable with coming to this theater. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel it as a kind of a gateway to other theaters. You know, maybe mm, that's true, yeah. after two or three performances here, maybe you try something in Portsmouth that's a little uh a little bit different right you, you can be comfortable in doing that and that's what i'd like to do i'll really like to do right get people comfortable and familiar in that kind of a setting or yeah yeah sorry what were well you i was just gonna say so my boys started going to hat attack when they were young and i think going to local theater i mean this is the age of video games and yeah. and instant gratification and right. <laughs> all those things and i think um i i'd be curious to know like what percentage of the young population goes to theater but my boys, I can tell you, love theater to this day. That's great. And I think it's because they started going when they were young. Yeah, for that's sure. great. But your boys, I, I do think it's a dying art. I hate to tell you. I know. Yeah, but it's very, very difficult. To, it needs to have a resurgence. Yeah. And even when you saw people like, um, I mean, there's been two or three talk show people. I can't even think of her name. What's what's the lady? Um, give us a hint. We might be able Oprah? to talk show. Oprah? Not Oprah. <laughs> Maybe Oprah too, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres. DeGeneres. There's another girl that used to do a talk show in um, movies and plays and stuff. They really promote, you know, Broadway shows a lot, which is good, but this isn't Broadway either. Right. You know, this is a long ways from Broadway. We do different kind. It's a different style. Sometimes people would never come here, but they would go to a Broadway show. Broadway shows are big technical extravaganzas They now. are, and they're and, also very expensive. And, well, very expensive, <laughs> but it's a different kind of thing. The techni- it is a different kind of thing. We're not going to spend that much money on technical things. Absolutely right. won't do it because we haven't got the money to spend. No. We spend our money on, you know, imagination and, you know, artistic skills. And that's what you've got to be interested in watching when you come here. And frankly, I think people aren't interested in that as much And I anymore. think that's too bad because I think it's special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's akin to reading a book where you're using your imagination. Yeah, exactly. Right. And yeah. I never got that sense that it was lacking that. When I've come, lacking the extravagance. Extravagance, of well, you go to a Broadway show and you see the, the, the you know, the millions of dollars. And but you expect a big step up in that department in a Broadway show. Yeah, but yeah you never felt like you were missing something going to theater here. No, but obviously your expectations should be somewhat adjusted. Mm-hmm. But I'm always surprisingly. Yeah, I know. I'm always surprised too. Surprisingly, so you, you, pleasantly you surprised. Saw, the show last year we did, I'm, I'm sure you didn't see it. I didn't get here last year, I hate Bra- to admit Bridges it. Bridges of Madison County. Oh, how was if it? If I talk about it right now, I'll start crying again. Uh, it was an extremely well done show. Uh, see, uh, that's like the best love story. The other thing you don't get in like a big theater is that intimacy. Oh, the intimacy, it, very true. It's so, true. I feel like you are yeah. kind of, very intimate. feel like you know the <laughs> yeah, actors absolutely. by the end. Yeah. And actually, some of theater, there's some People love to come and see a person do one show, uh, you know, one week and come back two weeks later and see them do a completely different part. Yeah, that's, love that is that. fun. Yeah. So, Mike, so just tell us, like, okay, picture yourself in dead of summer. Things mm-hmm. are crazy. Mm-hmm. What's a day like? What's a typical day like? Well, don't forget that I'm working. I'm up every morning at 230 Doing your yeah, real job. My, my real job. That's at two, <laughs> Quote, unquote. Three, three o'clock, actually. That is early. I'm up at 2.30. Wow. And I'm out. Well, I mean, it's almost your so, bedtime then. So, I'm so working, do you stay uh, awake for the whole show or you not usually. say hello at the beginning and then come you, go to correct. bed? Yeah. yeah. But you, I don't know what the problems are going to bring either. But anyway, so my typical day, I mean, I work all day from my regular job. Usually get home here at 2 or 3 o'clock usually go into a set of meetings from whenever I get home, four to six o'clock usually. Yeah. Because by six o'clock, we want to be cleaning up and getting ready for the show that's after eight o'clock. Yeah. You know, going into the box office and checking box office things, making sure that the theater is clean, making sure that we don't have any major problems that have developed in the sets of the props of the actors. I mean, hopefully no actor is sick, whatever. I, I have no idea what problems are going to come up. And by 8 o'clock, we have to be ready to start the show if we, it's assuming we don't have a matinee and have already had one show in the day. I also check the rehearsals. I mean, we've got rehearsals going on all the time as we have shows going on all the time. So I'm constantly reading rehearsal reports and, and show reports every day. You know, what happened? Was there an issue? Right. What do you we know, need to do? What do we need to do? Mm-hmm. Almost always, whatever we need to do involves money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of so course. So they're going to be coming to me sooner or later. Right. So it's just one stressful message uh, after another. <laughs> so, I mean, 
and, and then eight o'clock, we, you know, we start the show and hopefully if we have no big problems that need to be addressed, try to go to bed by nine or nine thirty, mm, yeah. usually before uh, intermission. Yeah, that's still yeah. not a lot of sleep. No, I'm, I'm getting used to it. <laughs> Get used, used to it. it. Are you offering any children's theater? Yes, we have a children's theater program as well that kind of runs in conjunction with everything else all summer. So what does that look like? Do kids have to sign up? It's a kids camp, and the campers will put on their own production. They have a five-week rehearsal process, and then we'll put on this year two performances of the show, which this year will be Jungle Book. Oh, uh-huh. uh-huh. So is it too late for kids to sign up for that? or As we speak today, no. Okay. Uh, the the so. camp starts in July. Okay. Right after the 4th of July. So right. almost another month to and sign up. And what ages are you looking for? Uh, 7 to 13. 7 to 13. So okay. in five weeks starting after the 4th of July. Yes. So the performance would be sometime in August? Yes. And it's a it's matinee? Uh, yeah, Friday and Saturday morning. Was there anything you would like yeah. to talk about? Well, as, <laughs> as career counselors, I see an awful lot of young actors. Uh, the college is really putting out a lot of actors, singers, dancers. I mean, UNH, for example, has a aerial dance degree. Wow. Um, I thought you were going to say club <laughs> no, <laughs> degree. degree program how many jobs do you think there are for aerial dance specialists not many no colleges are putting out many more choreographers uh, dancers than the world needs i mean i am very supportive of dancers of course i love to are. watch dancers i hire more dancers than anybody else uh in the county i'm sure right. maybe not a gunker playhouse right. but i'm not opposed to dancing at all a degree in dancing i mean right you've spent 30 40 60 80 thousand dollars for a dance degree <laughs> well something that's kind of interesting is reading career trends uh-huh. with a lot of robots taking over Uh a lot of that the creative jobs are less in jeopardy in some ways but also the trades if you were to take a a dance degree for example Mm -hmm. and put it together with a robotics degree oh maybe then you've got something to work with (laughs) right or become a plumber and a dancer because those jobs we need a lot of trades but that's what i was trying to say is Mm. that there's a lot of work in the trades right Mm -hmm. now and they are not in jeopardy of being taken over by a robot well i think i would advise for some of these people that are in musical theater programs and dance programs and those sort of things the is performing that they, arts. The performing arts and maybe all kinds of arts. And right. it's not that I'm opposed to art Of course you're not. Of course all. not. You're one of the yeah. biggest but supporters of art. <laughs> maybe if it's what you love to do, you should still continue to do it. Yes. But maybe not think that that's going to be your career. I know there's not many yeah. career opportunities in that. And plus, even if you do have pretty steady work in that field, there's a lot of downtime between shows. And mm. that's a great point. I can see where you're coming from. You feel badly for these young people that are putting so much time and, and money. Money. into a degree that may or Absolutely may not pay off. Absolutely unbelievable yeah. amount of money. Yeah. I know. It's may just, want to combine that with something on I mean, the I, practical side. I pay everybody. I mean, I don't pay much though. I can right. tell you that. I, I wish I could pay more. I'm sure. You know, but I'm sure. for $250 to get paid for three or four week of dedication, that's not going to pay your bills. You know, no. hardly pays the gas money to get back and forth from where you live to Right. Here. I don't know um, if some of these young people are uh, opening up their own dance studios or how they're using it but anyway we digress <laughs> yes we digress well i think we've pretty much covered everything so michael guftel thank you so much thank for being you. in our podcast yeah we so appreciate it i think this anybody that's interested in theater or what theater projection looks like or being a fruit and produce or produce salesperson yes. and manager will have gained a lot from or a combination or a combination <laughs> there right there's not too many people that have that combination no not at all you're one in a million. I think you're a living example of your advice. You have a practical career and you're living your passion as well. So, Or at least fulfilling your dad's passion. <laughs> I've fallen into it. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you, yeah, it Thank was you, great. Mate. Enjoyed it a lot. Michael was great. He was completely honest about the challenges of running a theater. Yes, but despite it all, he still loves what he does, and even though it's not lucrative, it clearly brings him and many others joy. At the end of the day, what is better than that? Not much. (laughs) (laughs) It is so cool how he has figured out how to combine his love for agriculture and theater into two amazing careers, and while I'm sure it is exhausting at times, my guess is he would not have changed a thing. 
up at 2.30 a.m. I am tired just thinking about that. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you live locally, we highly encourage you to go out and see a play this summer at Hamatek Theater. The plays are excellent and the Hamatek experience is fun and unique. You definitely won't be disappointed. Definitely not. And if you want to learn more about Hatmatak, please find the links in the show notes. Also, if you're interested in having a wedding at Hatmatak on their beautiful grounds, also check out the links. If you are still listening, we want to thank you for supporting our podcast. And please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We so appreciate it. Yes, we do. (laughs) (laughs) And as a final note, anyone interested in learning more about our business, academic and career advising services, we invite you to visit our website and we will include that link in the show notes. We assist people with changing careers, possibly finding that first job out of college, the college admissions process, selecting an academic major, deciding on a career, or things of that nature. You can check it all out on our website, Academic and Career Advising Services. We are located in Kennebunk, Maine. However, for your convenience, we also offer video conferencing services. You're never too old to change your career or to go back to college, and you're never too young to begin thinking about your future. We enjoy serving people of all ages. If you enjoyed listening to today's podcast and would like to help us out, could you please leave a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? This really helps others to find our podcast. We would greatly appreciate it. Also, to get all the latest on upcoming episodes, please follow us on social media. All of those links will be included in the show notes. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks so much for listening.